All right, folks, we are we're here. We're finally here. Sorry for the delay. Uh, we're having some technical issues. Um, I think Brooklyn's internet went down. <laughs> with that said, uh, we're alive. We're finally here. So um, welcome, everybody. If this is uh, if you're joining us again from yesterday, welcome back. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome for the first time. My name is Terry White, worldwide designer, photography evangelist, and I'm joined by the one and only Andre LaRoe from Brooklyn and Andre is a previous or former or alumni creative resident from Adobe and uh, also a portrait photographer and Andre uh, did, did some great things yesterday in Lightroom and we hope to see more of them now. And you got a lot of fans in the chat, Andre, people shouting you out. So they're happy to see you back. Andre, hey guys, what's up? I am so thankful to be back. Um, Terry and I had a lovely time testing, and then one minute before we were going to go live, my internet stopped working because everything that can go wrong will, but we are here, um, and you know what? It is a blessing to be in a place that is safe and that has allows me to access being around all of y'all. So um, apologies for making you wait, but I promise today will still be very good. Um, let me say from yesterday, we don't give Terry enough credit. It's hard to stream all this time, um, but I really appreciate you guys for coming back or coming to either um, and asking good questions. Those questions help steer me toward what's really valuable and important to you. So um, we're gonna start today like we did yesterday. Um, we're actually gonna hop over to Lightroom. So just to address something very quickly, we do know that obviously there's a difference between Lightroom Classic and Lightroom. Um, and since we used to form, since it was formerly called CC and now it is called <clears throat> Lightroom, it can be a little confusing for people that were primary Lightroom Classic users. But the concept of calling it Lightroom was focused around the idea that you had the same access to edit your photos everywhere on your phone, Lightroom Mobile, on your um, tablet, desktop, etc. And so, um, it, although it is confusing, think of a Classic as an exclusively desktop device and Lightroom as an attempted to be everywhere device. And so, um, here we are looking at Lightroom and like I said yesterday, something that's really awesome about the way that they've built Lightroom now is it's really built and focused on making you, you know, a better photographer in the ways that are valuable to you. So what do I mean by that? Obviously, the Lightroom app can't just like possess your body and make you um, a better photographer, partially because what makes you a great photographer is your eye and what you choose to um, photograph and how you capture it. But being able to figure out how to edit that and even how to explain your reasoning is a good way to kind of get started. I'm sure if you look at many of Terry's photos, he can explain to you um, why he chose to use the aperture he did, why he used the angle, shot the angle he did. And you can see a lot of that by being on our homepage, which you can access this is the Lightroom desktop um, by this left bar. So there's plus obviously to add photos, home, your my photos and sharing. Now when you're at home, you'll see immediately it says guided tutorials learning by doing. So as you scroll along here, you'll see stuff. So let's stop on my guy Omar, because he's cool. Um, Omar has these that are um, just his edits. So we're gonna talk about presets and profiles today. When you log in and you see this, it's taking a minute because like Terry said, all of Broken Wi-Fi is down. Um, you can go through his edit, you can see what he did, all everything over here see these shot on DNG, see what profile you use, exposure, and move along and edit with him. And then when you're done, you can hit save um, as a preset, which will then save into your presets folder, which we'll talk more about today. Um, but when I was saying guided tutorials making you a better photographer, what I meant by that is, let's go to learn. And over in learn, we have not, you see that the hover over doesn't work, but there are these before and afters. So, Terry, yours is, let's do yours today. Where'd you go? Yeah, they, they, yeah, they uh, shuffle them every day. So it's just like finding the same tutorial you were looking at yesterday is sometimes a challenge. Yeah. But yeah, I've got so a few before are. and afters in there. You can hit start tutorial and you see Terry has a subscription here. He's like, let's add some punch to this otherwise kind of flat portrait photo. Um, and then recompose it for a perfect portrait size that fits perfect that fits on Instagram. So what he means by that is Instagram, the crop is a little different. And so cropping it so that it fits the size um, 
allows people to engage with it better. What do I mean by engage with it better? I'm sure you guys have all been on Instagram. Um, but when you go on Instagram, let's just say for argument's sake, because I feel like showing is always better than telling. I love how it just didn't populate Instagram. Like I don't go on it all the time. Um, <clears throat> you'll see that here's the difference between these photos. This is a portrait photo. And so when you're on your phone, it actually gives you more real estate than if you did a horizontal. And it's not anything bad. It's just you lose some detail. Um, and people uh, generally, like according to data, um, interact better with these portrait images. So that's why Terry has that going. Um, so if we start the tutorial, it'll load up. Um, and unlike the other one where you kind of click through, here each one has a little chapter. Um, the author writes what they're thinking. And so it can help you start to articulate what you were trying to do and why you're trying to do it, which I think is super valuable as a photographer because like, I, like my mom told me many years ago, you don't know something until you can explain it to somebody else. So um, we're just going through a couple of steps. We're not gonna do all of it right now, but I just wanna show you when we get to the next chapter. So here he says, a centered image isn't as very compelling. Lead the viewer into the subject by cropping the image to recompose it. So you get his mental space and then you immediately are starting to see what he did. So you're, you're like, okay. And then now you have a reason to use the tools instead of just kind of poking around. So um, the reason why I bring this up is after this session is done, I know Terry does them every day. I know I do them sometimes, but um, giving yourself the opportunity to learn at your own pace, to go back and forth can be really valuable. And so this learn and discover page is something that um, Adobe's worked really hard on and Terry and I have written um, some tutorials on. So you can see them here. Um, I can drop the link later when I get a chance in the chat um, for my page and Terry's page, but just wanted to kind of shout out that composition. So um, just to kind of get us back into it really fast, when we look, um, this is our basic Lightroom organizational page. I have albums. Albums are folders that hold images, which I realize is confusing because there is something called folders on Lightroom. But for Lightroom Classic folks, folders are essentially collections um, and albums are what, for, what folders used to be. So if you think of it this way, um, if I had this little um, book as a folder, um, I can just go ahead and I did bring props for this very reason today, put my photos in. You just tapped your sound got disconnected. Oh, there you, no, you're good. You're whatever you did again, it okay. brought it back. Whatever you're tapping Sorry. on <laughs> took your mic out, but you're back now. Oh man, so all I was saying was, if you just stuffed your photos all inside of a folder, they'd be disorganized. A folder, however, can hold many albums. So your photos go into albums and albums go into folders. That's all I wanted to say. So I have a folder for you guys called streaming. And then I have an album inside of it called Curves and Color Mix because hopefully I'll be invited back and then I'll make another album inside of streaming where we'll talk about another subject. But today we're gonna talk about color mix. Um, for the folks that didn't get to come yesterday or didn't get to watch the stream yet, which you can afterward, um, I know that the links will be posted and I did repost it on my Instagram Live. Uh, it's also on YouTube, on Behance and Terry's Twitter, so there's no excuse for you trying to find it. Um, we yesterday went through this image and talked about how we could use curves to turn it from this very blue um, guy into something that's passable, not perfect but um, how curves can be used to make really specific edits. We then went ahead and went along the same theme of taking a photo from the street, and we use curves to take it from this kind of darker um, image to this brighter one, and we talked about how to use um, the selector tool to be really, really accurate. So what I wanted to do was go back over that very quickly today and then have us hop in and do um, another edit that we'll like. So I wanted to go ahead and... And Andre, while you're getting set up for that, I'm gonna just take them over the schedule real quick since we didn't do it at the intro. So you can just go ahead and get that photo yeah, ready. go ahead. All right, so let's do that. So, uh, hey everybody. So today is another fulfill, full, a full schedule of fulfilling content 
on Adobe Live. And just let me uh, just quickly take you through the schedule so you guys can see it. Uh, so we, this morning, we already kicked things off with getting started in Adobe XD and Photoshop, uh, the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge. Now we're up live doing photo retouching with Andre. And then, gotta love the fire trucks in Brooklyn. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. It, it just lets us know that life still goes on. All right. Anyway, uh, after we're done, you'll have the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge um, with Andrew and then Editorial Design with Stephanie, Adobe XD Daily Creative Challenge uh, with Howard uh, after that, and then Draw Along with Kyle Webster and finishing the day off will be the Design Off with Voodoo Val and Brandon. So you have a full you know, full day of content on Adobe Live, usually every day. I do want to remind everyone that Adobe is like, we're, we're off tomorrow, so uh, I don't believe there's any new live content tomorrow, but there will certainly be, you can always watch replays. Um, and then we'll be back um, again on Monday with a, another full live schedule. So you have a ton of content you can watch, and now we're going to go ahead and continue on with Andre uh, editing the next photo. So here's the photo I really like, but as we like to call it in the professional business, this is quote, dark as hell. So <laughs> let's go ahead and not have this be the darkest image of all time. Um, and a good way to do that is, as we get back to our little intro. Whoop, um, Terry showed me a new, new trick so we can zoom in in this corner. We're just gonna go ahead and select edit. Go ahead and select edit. We have our image that we like. It's up now. And over in this corner, we have all of our edit tools. So we have exposure, contrast, highlight, shadows, whites, and blacks. So we talked yesterday, um, and we talked about how exposure really alters the exposure of the image, plus or minus, but it increases all of the pixel values to be brighter or darker. And up here is our histogram, which I will try to zoom into. Up here's our histogram. Terry, are you seeing that? I see it. Yep. Okay. Oh, you know what's happening? It's zooming on everything that I have, so it looks to me like I'm only seeing a tiny corner. Okay, that's fine. Nope, you're, okay, you're good. So this is your histogram, and as you move the exposure, you'll see that all of a sudden, the graph that was formerly put it back to the middle. This is the base of the graph, which lets us know that there are almost no light values. So everything is kind of stamped, pushed up in this left side, which is our darks. So most of our details over here. So as we increase, we'll see that the graph is getting a little bit more even. And if we were to zoom out, we'll see that now this is kind of closer to what the exposure is that we're looking at. So this histogram can be very helpful because um, I know it's hard to read. Wow, that's like night and if day. If you're unused to it. Yeah. <laughs> it's literally like the before day. and after on that one. It's, it's like it went from what it shouldn't be to what it should be, just like that. Yeah, yeah there's before. So I'm, there's a before there's and there's an after. after. And I made a mistake, so I fixed it by using exposure. Um, so let's. how can we get to the same um, value in curves? So Terry talked about yesterday um, when he in 1938 when they first made computers and Photoshop and like all photo <laughs> editing apps only had brightness and contrast. Um, yeah. And so the, the thing we spoke about <laughs> was <laughs> using this target adjustment for the tone curve to come over here and figure out where all our detail is. Now, as we said, this photo is dark as hell, so we know that almost everything's going to be in this region. So. Maybe even the white is like a mid-tone. So we'll select this and we can, oh, we can start to slide brighter and you'll see that it's bringing all of our mid-tones up. But unlike the exposure we did before, you can still see down here in her shirt, you can still see that it's black, there's just more detail. So what I mean by that, by detail is you look on her shirt, you can see these little lines because it's a sweater that you completely lost before um, due to the fact that I underexposed this. Now, yes, this is an outtake photo. <laughs> and yes, I did never use this for anything, but I wanted to go ahead and use it today as an example. So if we're not sure about the detail, like I said, look at it zoomed in, this is our before, 
and this is our after. It's day and night. So you can still have detail in blacks, but a good way to make sure that you get it right is to bring your <laughs> mid-tones up like I just showed you. So um, this photo wasn't particularly difficult. Um, I'm not sure we're going to do a ton of RGB curve again, but I just wanted to remind you guys about the target select tool. Um, sorry, target adjustment tool and about what you want to do when you're editing through your image. So select points that will um, edit it to your liking. So, sorry, that's me continuing to hit delete. That is a quick little reminder about how curves works. Um, and let's, here, we'll do one more. So I know all of us have loved ones that are older, and I think often we can forget how important it is to take photos of them. Um, and so this is a portrait I took, not of a loved one of mine, but of a woman I uh, photographed after a CNN thing. She's really, really lovely, and I put her in some window light. We took a photograph in her home. Um, this wasn't a final photo that I chose, but I just wanted to show you, we go back to edit. First of all, we'll see this curve is a lot better than the other one. <laughs> As Terry said, it is day and night. But um, I want to brighten up kind of over here. We, we just have like a little bit of, it's a little dark. And since I'm, let's pretend I'm not sure where that is. So I can go ahead and look and we'll see that that is some of my blacks, not my darkest mid tones. So I will make a point here. And then I will make a point here. And this point I chose is the one we're going to move. So remember we talked about almost crimping our edges so that what we move here, um, the line, if you look at the curves line here, I'll show you to you a little bit easier. If you look at the what happens with the curves line, it's really adjusting this area more than it's adjusting um, the other side of our point. So instead, if I got rid of this point and I just move this along, you'll see that the entire curve moves. So what we're going to do instead is keep this point in, and then as we move, we're getting some more kind of specific adjustments that we want. That makes sense. Very lastly, um, as we're raising in curves, the top right corner are your highlights and the bottom right are your shadows and in the middle the spots are your midtones. Um, if you want to go for that faded film look, you can go ahead and pull your blacks up and you'll see that the areas that were very dark before are now have this kind of flatter gray look, which can have value. I don't think, think it's necessarily helpful here, but it's just something for you to keep in mind. Um, does anyone have any questions about curves before we continue? We're going to spend much more of today on color mix, but I just want to make sure that all of the folks that wanted to flex on their friends about being able to use curves know how to, to do it and talk about it intelligently. All right. And so while uh, if anyone has a question, just as always, go ahead and ask in the chat. That also reminds me, uh, if you're watching this somewhere else, meaning you're watching this either on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, however you're watching it, that's great. But if you really want to participate in the chat, you need to head over to b.net slash Adobe Live. So yep. behance.net or b.net slash Adobe Live is where we're really paying attention to the chat. And that's where um, the information and links and all that will go. Um, and speaking of which, um, uh, uh, just to give some shout outs to folks in the room, uh, Tanya, uh, representing the ATL, glad you're here. You're like virtually close to, to where I am. Uh, Andrew, hello. Uh, let's see. Keith, uh, Keith's meeting is over. I'm not sure which meeting Keith's talking about. And of course, Tim, uh, keeping the chat in line uh, as a moderator and also reminding me that there will be some Adobe live streams tomorrow, just not the full schedule. So I'll, there won't be any of the master classes tomorrow, but there will be new streams to watch tomorrow. So just keep that in mind. All right, um, and Francisco, uh, learn something new. This is awesome, great, or thanks, and thanks. I'm glad it's awesome that you got something out of it. And Tricia, awesome as well. And Andre, I'm not seeing any questions, but we will uh, keep taking these little mini breaks to come back to make sure everyone's still checked in and everyone is uh, uh, still grooving and learning. Okay. So continue on. All right. So here we are. Let's talk about color mix. Does anyone know who, the, who this gentleman is? Um, maybe it'll help if I put them next to each other or what this room is. Any New York people will definitely know what this dingy basement is. <laughs> um, this is 
in Milk Studios, they have this like kind of secret room covering graffiti. And these are the folks, uh, Jesus and Miro. And Jesus and Miro are uh, the Showtime late night hosts. They're super kind. And sometimes I go listen to the podcast live and take photos for fun. But as you can see, this room is almost entirely, as I referred to it with Terry yesterday, club lights. And so even if the white balance is right, which we talked about yesterday, it can have this crazy color cast. And so let's say that we think this is too red. How would we normally attack this? Um, I think that if I was getting more, if I was just getting it in the light room, I would just assume Assume that I would go over the saturation slider, which is how vibrant, not vibrant, <clears throat> how intense the color is. And so you'll see as I bring it down, it's making everything desaturated. So eventually when we get to negative 100, it is black and white. But if we start to bring it up, you'll see that it gets so bad, it's just crazy looking. So <clears throat> just to be clear, saturation is how intense the color is. Um, it is an overall tool, kind of like exposure. Um, it brings up the color intensity on all colors. Since we're in the color panel, it's also worth bringing up that there's vibrance. Vibrance, and correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, is a little bit smarter in that it figures out colors that are a little bit uh, more muted in the image, and it makes those more saturated. Yeah, another way to look at vibrance versus saturation is um, if, people in, if people are in your image, use vibrance. If there are no people, no skin tones to worry about protecting, then saturation's fair game. Because mm. vibrance protects skin tones and saturation does not. And protecting skin tones is important, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. So, um, and yes, I'm sure someone is like, man, this is the reddest photo of all time. I promise you, this neon sign is crazy. And if you look through these guys, um, the whole room is just <laughs> a Willy Wonka Wonderland. So, you're saying to yourself, all right, so so what? What are we doing now? We're going to go over this thing called color mix. And what color mix is, and once again, we're going to zoom, is this little circle here. When you click on it, you get all these like little fun colors that pop up. So we're going to change it back to color so we can go ahead and select. And these are all of our colors that we want to pay attention to. Now, uh, does anyone take a guess which color I'm going to pick for this? Red, obviously. And so just to walk every walk us through this, easy killer. Um, our luminance is how bright that color is. So how bright the red is. You'll see on the slider, the way that it's lit, just like when we were looking at um, curves yesterday, this shows us getting the red closer to white and closer to black. Saturation, like we talked about, is how intense the color is. So how saturated is the red? And hue lets you kind of alter the hue of the red. I don't really know how to define hue without saying it, but um, by looking at it, you can figure it out. By going right, we're getting more yellow, more orange. By going left, we're getting more purple. So, oh. forgive me as I'm getting used to the Zoom key keyboard, uh, keyboard shortcut. We are down here in color. Let's actually collapse light, so. Oh. Let's collapse light so we're not um, feeling as confused. And so here we're on color. I'm going to say to myself, man, this red is a lot. I feel like over in his face, just it's too powerful. So I think the first thing I want to do is desaturate it just a little bit. So you're seeing the difference between when we desaturated here, which this red is just a little bit flatter, to when we desaturated in general, where all the color is being taken out of everything. Now, the thing to keep in mind is this isn't just this red. It's all of the reds. So if his, his, if this hoodie was red, which it might be, I think it might be an orange, or let's say that he had red lipstick on, um, though all of those would come down. So it's something to kind of be careful of. You can make, you can do an adjustment brush later, and we'll talk about that. But these color, these color mix tools speak to the specific colors in the image. So, just for example, here's a random photo I took. Let's go over to the blues, and as you can imagine. As we take this down, all of a sudden we have lost all of our color in our blue sky. But we still have this orange. We still have the skin tone of Eric's hand, which once again, you wouldn't get if you just went ahead and desaturated everything. So there is value to it. Um, the color mix tool is one of my absolute favorite things, not because of this very drastic change, 
but because it allows me to be able to control colors a little bit better and not have anything look too crazy, particularly when we're talking about people's skin tones. So um, just to kind of round out, let's get back to red while we're looking at Miro. Um, if we move this way on the curve, you'll see that the red's getting more purple or more yellow. Um, I actually kind of like this. I'm not gonna keep it this orange, but just something to keep in mind. Um, if we look at his hand, it's the best way to see it. So you see right now his hand has a little bit of this back um, purple. As we move the hue, you're seeing how much his hand is changing based on what we're adding and subtracting. So just something to keep in mind. And I did choose very dramatic examples to start so we could kind of get a hang of them before we see how we can use it um, in our day to day. So here, we're gonna go ahead and use our target tool just like we did before. We're moving along. And let's say that we wanna select this little area. So right now, when, you, when you're hovering with this, it gives you this option at the bottom. And let me zoom in on that so you can see it. Hue, saturation, luminance. Um, basically, as you move around, and you click, click something, It'll. this is the hue slider, but if we select saturation, you'll start to see this purple is now gray on one side, purple on the other. So obviously as you get more purple, it's more saturated, less purple, it's desaturated. And luminance, which we talked about, which is how bright that particular color is. So just like we did before, um, if we're unsure or uncomfortable, just kind of hopping in here and playing around, we can get to a point and say, man, you know what? I think this microphone's too red. So we go over here and we pick it, and we think that we may think that red is just. Oh. There we go. Now we're seeing that it's making all of the reds just brown, or if it's brightening up, it's more of a pink. Um, since saturation is the one we're most comfortable with, I think often we want to attack uh, using saturation. But um, sometimes, if you think something is too intense the answer isn't always to desaturate or unsaturate it, or desaturate it or saturate it more. I think often the, I've learned that luminance can solve a lot of issues in just brightening up the color. Jerry, you have any thoughts? Okay, so <laughs> that oh, was no. a lot to take in. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I should have, stopped, no. should have paused earlier. I was... <laughs> no, it's just like, any thoughts? Like, where do I begin? No, it's all good. Um... <laughs> sorry, no, it's just... <laughs> no problem. All good. Um, I, I, I no, I don't really have a lot to add other than again, watch in anything in Lightroom that you're adjusting. Watch your sliders, and and from a from a standpoint of, it's easy to overdo something. So you know, it was good showing the hand when you zoomed in and you showed the the difference that it was making on the hand. That you might not even be looking at the hand because you're looking at something else while you're dragging the sliders and it's adversely affecting another part of the photo. Um, yes. And just sometimes when you push a slider too far, you'll start adding artifacts or just weird halos. So just be mindful of that. Color, you're pretty safe on uh, from an artifact standpoint, but just keep in mind that dragging a slider in one direction is changing the overall photo. So there may be other areas of the photo where it's making it look weird. Uh, but in your case, those are all good examples. And again, if you if you like the colors the way they are, that's where vibrance and saturation come in. It just gives you yeah. more of those colors. So, yeah. hey, I love the purple and, and, the, and the lights up in the, in the roof there. Uh, just give me more of that purple. So just increase the vibrance or increase the saturation. Which is cool that you have this much control. And so just as a reminder, this is what we started with. See how red it is? We took this red out. And I'm not saying this is a good edit by far. I'm just showing you what our opportunities are, which we can work with. So we brought our luminance of our red all the way up. So you can see that that same selection we made specifically was reflected over here on your sliders. So let's move on. I'm gonna show you a more practical use of this now and how I use it kind of day to day. We're gonna exit a little, we're gonna zoom, scroll up, and we are going to use one of these photos of my friend Janelle that we talked about. And so, um, Janelle has a warm skin tone. She's on a nice, warm, orange background. Um, this was for a series I did called How to Shoot and Edit Darker Skin Tones, which you can see on my Instagram, on my Twitter, on my Behance, on Adobe, on Adobe Create. 
Um, and the whole thing about it is understanding what people's skin tones are and how to put them in positions to make them look very natural. So here she's a warm tone person on a warm background. But if we see our before, you'll see that um, I added a little bit of um, contrast and <clears throat> actually made it a tiny bit more green. But in the process, this image is a little too orange. You'll see if you look at her original skin tone, it's a, a little more matte, a little more flat. But I think sometimes without realizing it, we can start to make people look a color that they aren't. And so sure. I use color mix in situations like this to say, I know that generally the main spectrum of human color is this orange, a little bit of yellow, and a little bit of red. And so here, like I said, I'm not really gonna mess with hue at the moment, but I might start by saying, let me see what the luminance does. So we're seeing it moving luminance up, how it's making her entire skin tone seem different, right? It's seeming a little brighter, which might be good, might be bad, we can always go back and forth to the final and the original. I still think that it looks a little too orange. And so um, if I increase saturation, oh no, that adds orange. I don't want to do that, right? So instead, I'm going to start to bring it down. And you're seeing how her skin tone is getting a little bit closer to what it looked like originally, while still having a, a photo I think is very powerful. Um, so we still have the edit we like. Actually, I think it's a little dark, so let's, no, I was going to use exposure, but let's uh, let's use curves for continuity. Come over here. We think over here is a little dark. So let's crimp here like we showed. Oh, sorry about that. I'm actually going to do it by holding on here. Just pulling up a little bit. But you see now as I do it, this side of her face is getting a little too bright. So I should crimp on the other side like I showed y'all. Um, so let's add a point there. And you'll see that generally her face is kind of staying the same in that one spot. So before what was happening was as I was pulling it up, this was getting too bright. And the reason for this is I was using a strobe and she it was this is when we were still light testing and I had her only only side of her face facing it. So that's why these exposures are so different. Um, if for some reason I really wanted to use this image, I would go ahead and pull it into Photoshop. Um, and I would like more specifically dodge and burn it. Or, like we talked about yesterday, we can go over this adjustment brush. Um, we can kind of just paint this side. Sorry, let's make this guy a little bigger. All right, and, and while you're doing that, Andre, you got a couple couple questions, and yep, and I bring exposure so. down. So here we are. This is a lot a lot better than where we were. Um, and to since I can't do a before and after in the same way, I'm going to show you. We went from something that was pretty orange and some uneven light on her to much more reasonable, and her face looking a little bit more evenly lit on both sides. So sometimes it's just a question of. Um, figuring out, you know, there were some deficiencies, deficiencies in how I shot this. How do I want to fix it? What do I want to do? I want to make sure she looks like herself. And I also want to make sure um, that things are even and palatable to look at. All right. So let's start with the questions. Okay. So, or this is not really a question as much as it is a comment. So Asa says, it's interesting to see how you're spending uh, most of your time with details that a lot of people wouldn't typically notice. I don't know if that's a a critique or a question or just a comment or <laughs> observation or what that would be, but uh, I love it. You can answer it, but I, I would say that it, it's really uh, it's not so much spending time as, as him showing you what's possible. And a lot of times we will spend time on a lot of little things that maybe you wouldn't notice individually, but add up to a better portrait. So that that would be my take on spending time on where I'm tweaking this one little thing or removing this one little distraction. Well, you remove all the little distractions. Now everyone can concentrate on your subject. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's an image I love that I have. Um, I took it during a project I did called Nation of Newcomers. And for argument's sake, we can bring it up. Um, it's a portrait project I did about um, 
how people got to America. I immigrated here from Jamaica and I love <clears throat> I like really appreciate getting to tell the story. And basically I can show you the photo of this. Um, this portrait I took, the this woman had like pretty serious acne, and I'm not a big fan of um spot retouching non like fashion jobs because I think that it's kind of rude to the person. But um I found that it was so distracting with the image. Um, I don't even know if we can find it on Instagram that we just took the took more. We took ended up taking more blemishes out when we ended up publishing it for social, just so people um, could focus on her story and not pause and say, "Oh, like this acne," because we're we are pretty superficial. And so, being able to make sure that um, Janelle isn't glowing in this way that is unnatural, um, I think, ends up being a positive for all of us. So, okay. Yeah. All right, and let me go back up a couple of scroll by there. So uh, let's see. Uh, Marcy says, love the power of luminance. It solved a lot of problems for me. Great. Uh, hey, Marcy. I like the luminance. Uh, Kirsty saying, I like the luminance panel. Uh, I like the luminance panel too. That is my favorite bit in Lightroom. Wow, the luminance panel is your favorite in Lightroom? That, that's, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah. uh, Carolyn Brown. So this is one that's question always comes up um, at some point or another when you're talking photos and working on screen. So... Do you cal do you use calibration software to make sure your computer screen is accurate, or do or what do you do about people seeing your images on their screens, which makes which may look different? Uh, huh. So I I believe Terry and I almost answered not the same but a similar question yesterday, in that we can't control what how people view things, but there is a sense of like it, it's. It's almost like the um, the concept of like um, of perspective. Sometimes there are certain things that are right, and certain things that are wrong, and there are some things that um, we can all have an opinion about. But if um, I present something incorrectly for a small group, when a larger group does something, it doesn't really help. So, for example, like back when Internet Explorer was popping, and a lot of people were using it, it would make sense to design things that would look best on Internet Explorer because the largest market share would look at it. And so I'm not saying that everyone's computer is super calibrated or their screen is, but I would assume that it's within a reasonable range that if I had things looking correct, that the majority of people would see it looking correct. Um, and so that's kind of my way to say, like, I I don't know, Terry, I'm sure you calibrate your screen. I've done it once on a different <laughs> screen. And I'm, I'm using a screen Don't now. be so sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using so, a screen now that somebody calibrated for me w before I got it because I got it from someone who would do that. Um, basically, what my point is is that I'm I try to have it be as true to color and true to person as possible. Um, and that way, even if unless someone's screen is like crazy in the other direction, um, that it's it's still accurate. Got it. All right. So my my take on uh, screen calibration it's something that. If color is important to you from yes. your monitor to, let's say, a print, and it has to match the color, that's when color calibration comes in. That's where people have traditionally always used color calibration. Whether it's a, uh, a sensor on your screen with software that calibrates your screen, people wake up every day and calibrate their monitors um, because they're in that color critical workflow. I'm not in a color critical workflow, so therefore, I haven't calibrated a monitor. I, I think the I did calibrate a monitor in the last decade. It was um, I got a Wacom Cintiq Mobile Studio Pro, so it's like their their tablet um, screen based tablet computer, and it was so different between what I was used to looking at on my MacBook Pro screen that I just couldn't take it anymore, and I had to calibrate it so that they matched. That was the <laughs> only reason. Like it was just because. I'd be retouching an image and the image will look redder on the, on the Wacom than, out of the box yeah. than it did on, on the MacBook. Once I calibrated it, they looked the same. And then that was it. And it's just like I got that monitor looking the way I should. I wanted it to look. Never thought about calibration again. So um, I would say the vast majority of people won't ever calibrate a screen. They won't ever mess with it. They won't ever attempt it because... If it looks good enough on your screen, you can't control what everyone else is going to see on their screens. So you can calibrate all day long. You're still going to have that problem. 
Um, yep. And if you're not working in those color critical workflows, that it has to be that exact blue, it has to be that exact uh, pink or whatever, then people just won't do it. Um, the uh, the other thing to think about is that if you're if you're like when I print when I have a print done, uh, I'm looking at like okay I see her shirt or it looks green. If if yeah. it's relatively close to that, <laughs> I'm 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 good. Like it doesn't. I'm not going to put them next to each other and say it's about two percent off and therefore I need a new print. It's green. I'm good. It, it, it doesn't need to be exact. So that's that's my spiel on color calibration. If it's important to you, do it. If it's not, don't worry about it. Other thing to keep in mind is um, some of you now wear glasses that have little blue tint, um, which helps you not have eye strain. And even that little blue tint can make some things look a little bit different. But it, I still think that um, editing it so that it is as close to accurate as possible on your screen is helpful, unless for some reason someone later tells you, yo, this look crazy orange, and then you calibrate and work from there. Um, and calibration, you could Google, I am, this is not that kind of class. <laughs> um, right. So let's talk about color mix war. Um, or wait, unless are there other questions? Well, other let, me, questions? let me keep going. So that was, uh, that was a question about color calibration, and there were a couple more. Um, blah, 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 blah. All right, Asa said it was just a comment. No problem. Oh, ain't nobody mad. Ain't no problem. Yeah. No, it wasn't a problem. That's why I was smiling when I was reading your comment. Um, okay. As Shannon said, ain't no problem. Trisha's uh, given a comment just about, uh, although, it's, although it reinforces the difficult... It reinforces difficult to realize standards of beauty and what's acceptable to look and what isn't reality. Tough balance, aesthetics, and acceptance of human fatality or human frailty. And I agree. And so uh, every time I'm doing a retouch, especially if I'm doing it publicly or live, uh, I always point out that, you know, Andre mentioned just removing um, acne or blemishes. Um, my rule is that if it's something temporary, like if two weeks from now that whatever it is wouldn't be there, then I, I, I would have no question about removing it because in other words, a person should be punished because they're having a bad skin day or a bad hair day or a bad whatever day. And that's not the way they look every day. So I don't have a problem correcting or fixing whatever those issues are. Uh, but if it's something that is permanent, like a beauty mark, a mole, a, a birthmark, whatever it is, then that's between you and your subject. So you and you, the person you're doing it with or doing it for, um, that becomes a, a question to them. So, hey, do you want that mold, you know, removed or not? And if they say, oh, no, the mold is like my favorite feature of my face, then, of course, you don't touch it. So it really depends, A, what it is you're thinking about retouching or removing or changing, and B, if your subject is okay with it. In other words, you shouldn't be doing things that make your subject cringe. You shouldn't be doing things that make anyone cringe. So it's like you know, I've seen um, ads for um, body reshaping plugins, and the before and after they show are just they're cringe worthy because they just they make such a drastic difference on the person that I can't imagine anyone would want that done for their client, let alone themselves. So just keep that in mind that. Retouching is a very sensitive subject. It all depends on you and your client. And um, there are rules to it. You should never overdo it. And you should never make someone feel uncomfortable with what you did because you just made them look so drastically different than what they really are or how they really look. I agree um, with Terry. Okay. So let's see. Uh, Carolyn, I li like these guys that don't calibrate. Uh, my computer. I like these guys that don't calibrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, great point on the skin. It has texture. People have pores. Absolutely. Should never make it Barbie-ish plastic. <laughs> Should never be a plastic skin. Um, okay. We can move on. We can move on. Sorry, I just had to restart my Lightroom for a second. Um, I was trying to find the image, the before and after, to show you. It was just, it was just distracting. Um, I asked her about it. She said it was okay, and she was just having a breakout that day. Um, 
and yeah, so I just didn't want it to distract from her talking about her family story and how um, how they got to America, which I thought was actually really, really powerful. So anyway, we're relaunching. We're back in the thick of things, or we're about to be. We're going to go back to our folder right. that I made just for y'all. And inside that folder is an album that's also just for y'all, just for today and yesterday. But, you know, we don't want to get into it too much. And we are going to get back and talk about color mix. So um, just to demonstrate Hugh, I have a photo of, um, I took very bad photo, but I took my friend Steve Sweatpants late at night. Um, and we just had him stand as close as possible. Is it, you took a picture of Steve's Sweatpants or that's his name? His, his name on the internet is Steve Sweatpants. Sorry. Okay. All right. Just, just clarify. <laughs> I'm like, wait, are you photographing sweatpants or is that Steve's name? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, internet people. This is Steve. Just Google Steve sweatpants. We'll see what I'm talking about. He's cool. Um, All so right. just for color mix purposes, um, I just want to show y'all hue since we haven't talked about it a lot. So you'll see as I slide the hue, how his jacket is changing. Um, and if you want to see it a little closer now, why does this matter? I know some of y'all, Thanks. Still getting used to this. Uh, this zoom in with the uh, with the keyboard, but some of y'all um, are big fans of selective color on um, on Photoshop and color adjust. Well, sometimes you don't need to do that. Yesterday, someone asked Terry and I about when we use Photoshop and Lightroom um, and why. And one of the things Terry said is you use Lightroom to develop, and that's true, but they have imported some features um, that maybe were originally in Photoshop that you can do here that people do very um, constantly. So like I said, this isn't a good photo. You can see that actually the leaves are out of focus or in focus in the back. So Steve's out of focus, but actually kind of fun in a way because he's a playful dude. But I just wanted to show you that if you wanted to alter this color just a little bit to make it a little bit more orange or even more purple, if for whatever reason that option is available to you. And so the hue gives you that. Also, there are many ways to organize your color mixer. So you can have it based on color, which I like because I'm usually working on um, one color at a time. So if we move over to red, then we're on red, blue, et cetera. But you can also organize it by hue, which is the colors lined up based on hue. So we can um, move everything around as we see fit. You'll see how the greens are changing, et cetera. And as, um, if you ever want to go back to where you were, you just double click on the slider, it'll go back by saturation, which once again is how intense the color is. Um, and let me zoom in so you guys can see. There's not a lot of yellow here, so you won't see it, but if you you can see how the green is shifting if we're uh, focused on it, how saturated the green is. And the luminance, which is ooh, how bright everything is. So this alters how bright the greens are. So we can see the greens getting darker, more moody, brighter. Um, and the reason why I'm showing you all this is so that when you start to say to yourself, okay, so I have, a, I have an image I like. I wanna focus on the color of it. I want this image to focus on the um, complementary colors that red and green are. And I want it to feel really moody. It's nighttime. I took this on a slow shutter or it's almost night, it's twilight. And so I want my greens to be darker. Um, I want my greens also to be a little bit more blue. So it feels kind of like more imposing and um, has a little bit of that cross-processing look. And then let's saturate our greens more so that they're like pretty lush. Um, let's bring it back down so that our greens a little darker. And now you can see the difference between where the greens were and where they are now. And if you would like to see a closer example, you can look at some of these brighter greens that are up here, are before and are after. Very subtle Make differences. Out. Very subtle differences, but it, for me, it feels a little bit deeper. Uh, sorry, that sounded very lame. Um, for me, the <laughs> having the color be a little deeper is kind of a nice way to make it feel like it's more nighttime. And then let's say I want to make his jacket seem a little bit less bright. I just kind of want the whole thing to look flat. So I just wanted to show you like a subtle thing I might want to do. And then um, I believe this actually, this photo might have been edited already. 
I think I accidentally re-imported it, but that doesn't mean that I can't show you how I might take this red down. Um, I think this is a beautiful, I think this color is really, really nice, but there are various shades of red. There's actually this table's pink and this background's red and then his glasses are a different color. Um, and let's just say it just looks super overpowering. Um, instead of starting to desaturate and you see how we're kind of losing it all over, if we take our vibrance out, it might be a little bit better because you'll see that his skin tone still being protected, as Terry said. Um, my first thing actually is that I feel like his shirt is actually too blue more than anything else. So um, I'm going to bring my saturation of my blue down. Um, Terry, one thing I did want to ask you is, um, as I also bring my luminance down, so it's like a little bit, it's not glowing as much, it's kind of a darker color. Um, when you're looking at these mixers, I've always... It's always interesting for me, particularly the blue and the cyan, because I feel like they work in concert with each other and um, how you think about the difference between those two things. Well, again, they, they do work in concert. It just really depends on the photo. So, you know, if yep. a photo like a sky is, is probably going to be more blue than cyan, whereas his shirt, you know, it's kind of like a little bit of both. So it just depends. Yeah. Uh, but hang on, I'm, I'm just going to this here. I just want to see something real quick. Sure. So, yeah, did you, I can't remember, did you show the target in the upper left corner next to color, uh, next to um, saturation? Or in the, in the color mixer, the target in the upper right corner. What, what target? Uh, I'm sorry, little, go ahead and show it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll show it. Yeah, it's easier than me trying to, uh, right, yeah, yeah. Did you show that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, All right. <laughs> We set ourselves up well here. So, um, oh my gosh. And the reason I asked if he showed it or not, because in those situations where you're trying to guess which slider is it, the target will tell you. Because when you click on the, on the color you're trying to change and adjust it, it will drag the sliders for you that are that color. Yes. And so Terry walked this in very well. I asked him because it's a question I get and I also am confused about. And it sets up our ability to select our color here. Oh. Bring our saturation down a little and you'll see that it's actually working off the blue, not the cyan. And then now we have a shirt color that's a little bit less aggressive. And what do I mean? Look at our difference. Now that we've done it, you're like, oh, wow. This is just a little easier for me to look at. It's less unpleasant. And actually, it complements the red very well. Um, and so for me, I'm always looking at stuff and saying, like, is this pleasing? Do I like this? Um, how does this feel looking at it? And I think the thing that's nice about this image, I think his eye contact is great. I think the, the fact that he's framed by red all the way down to his eyes is really, really lovely. But once you start to zoom out from that, you can see an image that needs a little bit of work. So now that we brought this blue down, we're going to head over to our reds. We'll grab our little target adjustment again. Ooh. See, as we desaturate this, we're kind of losing that fun that we love. So we'll bring it back. But we're not going to bring it back all the way. So now we have just a little bit more muted in every way in the reds. And then lastly, like we talked about, everyone's... Um, generally, when you go through orange, it affects everyone's skin tone. So I actually think that his skin looks a little bit oversaturated. So I just want to bring it down a little. Um, and I'm sure you're wondering how much that difference changed. So we'll zoom in. Just It's very, very subtle, but a little bit less orange. And that's something I'd work on. And then lastly, this line is bothering me here. You can see that it's not even. So I would, this is the time we're talking about geometry versus cropping. I would just turn this a little bit. And that would be what I would do with this image. So um, kind of working through it, we talked about before, we have uh, an image that I'd already put through curves bright enough. When I first exported it, it was just a little bit too saturated. His shirt was a little too much, the walls a little too much. And so we brought it out a little bit, but it's still very powerful in a way. So. All right, cool. That's I got an example. Yeah, I got an example of what I was showing. So I just found an image. Do it. All right, let's do it. All right, so switching over to my desktop here. Um, I'm in the same color mixer that Andre was just working in. And so yeah. in the color mixer, you've got, um, just know that you've got a pop-up here for color, hue, saturation, and luminance. 
So between those four things, you're deciding what you want to do to a specific color. So the sky is nice and blue looking up through these palm trees. If I did want to adjust the, the for example, just the saturation of that color, well, I've got, I've got to decide which color do I want to adjust the saturation for. So this little target in the upper right-hand corner, the target adjustment tool, when it's either on or off, and when it's on, all you're doing is clicking on the color and it will decide what slider is that color. So in this case, it's saying, oh, that's blue, no problem. I'm adjusting the blue for you. That way you don't have to guess. If I come over here to the green, it's adjusting um, the green or the blue and the aqua, which make up that color in the tree. Now keep in mind, that's also adjusting the sky because the sliders, even though you're telling it what color to adjust, it's still adjusting the overall photo but you can at least pick the color really quickly that way. So same thing if I were to, let's undo, undo, go back. If I were to go to uh, color and I want to change the color of the sky, then now I'm actually, no, I'm not. I'm changing saturation. Hold on. I want to go to the hue. Sorry. If I go to the hue, uh, now I'm actually changing the color of the sky. And now I'm making the, the, the sky these different colors just by dragging. And again, it knows what color it is. And it's affecting the color that way. If I want to go in and adjust the luminance, um, the light values in the sky. So I can say make the sky brighter, make the sky darker. And again, based on that color. So anything that's that color is going to get adjusted. But it's just a quick way using a target to target a color that you want to do. Um, what do the square crop tools do? The square crop tools. I'm not sure. Oh, so you know. chat, I was like, I was like, Terry, what are you yeah. talking about? Okay. No, no, they're asking about the square crop tool. So if you're asking about crop, it has nothing to do with that. yeah, crops crop, but I don't know what, what you mean by square crop tools. All right. Uh, back probably to you. Be the one for one. Um, sorry. So just to answer that over here in crop, um, this allows you to go back to reset everything. Aspect ratio. So I think what you're asking is, what is our aspect ratio? So at original keeps it original. So that means as you move, you don't have to, as you move, um, it is going to keep the original ratio. I would advise holding shift so that you don't accidentally crop um, in an aspect ratio that wasn't intended. Another thing you can do is, depending on what output you need, you can go to your one for one, which is a square, which we used to have to do for Instagram before um, they allowed us to do things. If you guys remember, um, you also can do four for five, eight and a half by 11, five by seven. These can help if you're doing prints, but also this is also something to point out. Remember like different things on web sit differently. So this is what Instagram looks like. But if we go over to Twitter, you have to remember, and I, Going to Twitter can always be a dangerous game, so judge me not what we're about to yeah. see. But um, remember yeah, that. Yeah, by the way, she's asking a different question, but go ahead and finish. <laughs> oh, she's asking. I was say, remember she, that she, images she, crop differently. So, like, yeah. even this here's a picture of Tom Hardy. Great. Could have definitely been a crazier thing. But remember that this crops into a two by one. Um, so, sometimes if you want to ensure that the preview and the other thing are exact, you want to go ahead and make that aspect ratio the aspect ratio that you want to. Um, be cropping to you when you leave Lightroom. That's okay. That was so, you're right. So what she's referring to, she, first she said, what do the square crop tools do? And you explain what, what a square crop is. But then she, uh, she went on to say, uh, he used the little squares to crop, the tiny little, the little tiny squares. So, oh. I don't remember what, what that is. You were using some little tiny squares to crop or something? It oh. wasn't, I don't think it was the crop tool. Oh, Maybe geometry? Maybe. Okay, so let's pretend that it's geometry, and if we're not right, please um, correct me. I apologize. If you I just used it a few minutes ago. There was uh, little oh. tiny squares all over the picture, to, or all over the picture crop. Maybe it was the straightening, the grid? Maybe. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I feel so stupid right now. Um. Okay little squares she says thanks anyway <laughs> i don't i, I oh, don't no, remember yeah. what it was either um okay so we were in the color mix we were doing selective so this this was 
we were doing that, which is kind of there's some squares down here. I don't um, remember you cropping that, though. No, I didn't crop until just now. Maybe the grid like this. Maybe the grid that shows up. Maybe that was it. Um, the she grid just is just. It. It was, oh yeah, my grid. The grid basically what I was trying to focus on, and this is where look at this zoom from Terry. So smart. If you see this line, when I hold it, yeah, I'm it. trying to line up the line that the crop line, this vertical line right here with that pole, so that I know that it's straight. But it was on that red background. It was geometry. Someone just said. Yeah. So since we are talking about this, let's just go ahead. I pulled another example for you. This is straight out of my iPhone. It's a picture of my friend Noemi when we were doing a shoot in DC. And Terry Robb is still mad at me that I went to DC and didn't tell him I was there, but that's his business. <laughs> that's between you and Rob. He was on yesterday. I haven't seen him today yet. He was he was on. He wasn't heckling us. Shocker. No, he, okay. he, he was. He, matter of fact, he even said you you told him something. I forgot what it was, but he picked up a tip from you yesterday. Yeah. I know. So I praise here, for Rob. Wow, Rob. Look, guys, Terry is a kind man. Rob is a bully. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Rob's great. You should look at his work. <laughs> But um, there are like six black people and we all take it seriously. So here, um, I just want to show you what geometry does again. Um, geometry is a tool here. Let me collapse all these so this isn't as stressful for you all to look at. Effects, et cetera. And we will still be talking about color mix, but it's always helpful to have these little one-off tips. Here, we see an image and it looks okay. I took it on my phone. Um, but one thing you'll notice is it almost feels like the image is tilted. And by that, I mean, if you see that I, what happens when I start to move vertically, how the image will, you see how it's just starting to flatten and it looks more normal. Um, geometry is cool because you can move images on the X and Y axis for my former calculus people and nerds out there. Um, that, mean, that means if we're moving on the, if we're moving horizontally, we can move side to side, which helps kind of flatten an image out um, in either direction. And for me, this image, from the top looks like it's not straight. So I'm pulling down from the bottom until it feels like it's straight and then I can constrain crop. Um, and so we can look from going here to here. It's kind of hard to describe, but you see the difference. And the best way to put it is you can see how these lines just look like you're looking directly at her. I think I might've been taking this from higher up, it's like this. Um, and in doing so, I didn't keep it as flat as I wanted. And so it's helpful for you to be able to work on it from there. Um, if you don't like this, let's just gray it out. We, instead of doing it ourselves, we can go to auto and see what it does. Auto does something else that honestly might look better. You see these lines look a little straighter, but you can also say, all right, well, I want to do guided and draw my own lines. So we'll draw a line. And is she holding an ice light, looks like? Yep. Right. That's exactly what she's holding. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. We draw so one line very, here. Or a very short lightsaber. It was one of the two. Uh, I still haven't seen the last Star Wars movie, which I will do later today. Um, and now that it's on, hold on, let me. Straighten that out a little bit. Okay. I think we're good. Ooh, I forgot to hit enter or something. Hold on. But you can guide based on these lines and it will do what you need it to. Um, let me actually draw one more line here. I made, see, now it is nice and straight and kind of similar to what we looked at before with the auto. I was like, you're, you're saying you're done, but it, it didn't look like it changed. Now it changed. Oh yeah. I was, I was confused. I was like, I finished, I hit enter, nothing happened, but now you'll see the difference. So now let's go from our before and our after and these little things matter. I think that. It's flattened out. It's actually a more accurate um, kind of crop of what she looks like. Before it was like kind of elongating her legs in a weird way. And now we have an image that 
probably won't be used for anything, but looks right. And so we can move on. We're gonna go back to our color mix some more. Um, let's say some of you own a restaurant and um, you wanna make sure that your food looks its absolute best. Actually, let's go Sorry to this Thai food. Let's go to this Thai food I photographed instead. <laughs> um, you can see that I already have some edits in here. I would love to have dinner with you, Terry. I just did, you know, there's things in between like the fact that there's coronavirus and <laughs> just, you live not nearby and, you know. Yeah. Other other obstacles, um, and we'll, we didn't. We'll get have to do a virtual dinner. <laughs> we will. That'd be cool. Face, um, FaceTime dinner. About today because I um I wasn't late. The internet just cut out. But um, Corona is a really difficult time for everyone, and I'm thankful that you guys were taking some of your time out to spend time with us today. Um, I know some people lost their jobs, um, and I don't know. It's just it's a really difficult time. But as much as you can, like. Try to learn new skills and take some take some of the time that we should be taking to like rest and figure out how we feel. And um, besides that time that you're taking and your time to work, um, again, being able to have a little time to learn is really helpful. And so I'm taking this time also to try new things. And there's another ambulance. I don't know what it, yesterday was like the most seamless stream, and today <laughs> I had to restart Lightroom. The internet's not working. I don't know. All of Brooklyn is going to the hospital apparently, um, but. I just want to talk about other subtle ways you can use color mix. So we're here, we're looking at this food, it looks good. Um, this is a Thai restaurant that I photographed some stuff for, for a Brooklyn um, small business guide. And so I did some of my basic things. Um, I add a little bit of, actually, you know what? This is our original, it's just a little bit more flat. This is the one that I turned into them. Let's bring it back, it's a little brighter, um, but let us, use all the things that we talked about and go from our original. So we're here. Actually, do we like this photo bar? Ooh. I think I like this photo better, so we'll go from there. So let's go back to our original image. Let's take a look. It's a little bit flatter. We're gonna, just going to get rid of all our sliders. And we're going to start from our curve. Um, actually, I might have done some color mix things also. Yep, I definitely did. Um, Terry, what's the, there's a specific button to go revert back to the original. I do it on, um, on iPad all the time, but I haven't done it on desktop in a while. To revert back to the original or to do it before and after? To revert all the way back to the original, completely get rid of all the edits all at once. It is shift. Uh, looks like shift R. Okay. Oh yeah, there it is. You're right. All right, here's our original image. So let's use a lot of the stuff we've talked about over the last couple of days or last day. I don't know what I think I'm doing, um, and talk about how I would edit this. So first, it's a little bit dark. So instead of going all the way in that film look, I might just bring this up a little bit on our curves. So we can even see the quick difference of going from here to here. We're just kind of getting a little bit of this darkness back. Second, um, I would just, when I realize that these highlights, specifically right here on the plate, is going to be all the way up here. So I don't want those to be super bright. But these midtones could use a little bit of work. And so the midtones, as well as all the stuff that's going on in here, is a little bit dark. So let's select this point. And you guys are looking on the right side where the point curve is, and this point. And then we'll go right in the middle. And we'll just. You're making everyone in the chat hungry. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, we'll just go. Oh. We'll just come up a little bit. We'll take our point curve. Hold on. Select our point here. We'll start to bring it up. And we'll see that it's getting a little bit brighter, um, maybe almost too much. So I want to bring it up here. So now I can kind of see what we're working with, right? Um, I can see this food. Um, and normally, if I was not using curves, I would start to add some contrast back. but 
we're not going to do that right now. We're just going to look at this and say, how do we look? How do we feel about this food? I think it looks brighter, but I think that um, now our color is a little bit off. So um, if we're not sure what we want to do and curves are still intimidating us, let's take a look. We bring our highlights up and down. We'll see that the highlights being super bright in some way makes some contrast might be overtaking. So I might bring that down here. So our highlights are a little bit brighter. And so to achieve the same thing, I'd make another point on this curve and bring our highlights up. And so now our plate's a little brighter, the food's sitting down in something, um, and we're somewhere we like. Now, if I were over in the color, color, uh, the color curves, I'm going to say to myself, I think this is just a little bit, it's not blue, but I want it to feel warmer. So I want to come over to our um, blue and yellow, or the B on the, um, on the on the curves, you want to cover the be on the curves, and I want to add a little bit of warmth to this. And once I did, it now looks a little bit green. So I also want to add a little bit here. Um, when we put it all together, we are. Shoot, my before and after is kind of lagging behind. We have. Uh, something that is a little bit warmer. This warm is a little too much, um, but I like the fact that now um, I can see what we're gonna eat. The food looks good. Um, this green and this red still work, and we're looking at like an overall plate that looks pretty good. Now, I said that if I wasn't using curves, I would do something else, and I'll show you. So let's get rid of all our points. Oh, my bad. That was very foolish. You also have to have a point on each end. Get over all our points, let's get back to where we were. And normally what I would do is I would brighten this up. Um, I would also add, maybe actually take a little contrast out so we can see kind of what, why we slid up to that side. Bring our shadows up a little bit. Um, and now we can get a look at our food. Um, we talked about profiles and presets yesterday. I would, th this, if you click down here, it gives you a pro, like a, a hot spot of the ones you use most frequently. But if you go over, um, these profiles and presets can be really helpful because you can take a look and just see how does this food look different. Shoot, hold on. Why are we not? So now we have our, um, our profiles and presets set and I actually like this vivid the most. And the reason why what you looked at looked more savory before was because I had this profile on and I turned it off. Um, and like Terry and I talked about yesterday, your camera pro or sorry, your Adobe profiles are like camera profiles or like film for um, your film camera. It is like your base set line for your colors, um, and you can adjust the intensity, but you, um, but it doesn't adjust any of your sliders. And why is that important? Because it gives you a nice spot to kind of start with. So we had our before, we added vivid. And we have our after that's a little bit brighter on these edges and then from there um and for the people that are asking i definitely usually start with a profile or a preset um i can now say to myself okay i have it looking kind of savory i think that this mid-tone is a little is a little dark so i want to select the point here Oops, hold on let's move a little further out and point here I want to brighten this up a little bit. Not so much of the food kind of loses its panache. And now we have a plate that we like. Um, <laughs> I wanted to show you what what I would do and what I did with curves um, outside of the profile and with the profile. I apologize if that was a little confusing. I should have explained that through beforehand. But we want this to look appetizing, and I think that it does. Um, I might also add a little bit of texture in like Terry and I talked about yesterday. Here specifically, um, we want to be able to see how sharp this food is. And so adding a little texture in is helpful. And since this isn't exactly in midtones, clarity helps, but it's not going to do the same. So that's kind of what I would do there um, and how I'd work through that. Let's pick another thing. Since we all can't go anywhere, here's a bar. 
<laughs> with a drink right, on it. So before you before you dive into that one, uh, let's take a quick question break. Um, so Carolyn's asking, is it better to start with a profile or start with auto? And she's talking about auto tone. Carolyn, technically it shouldn't matter because profiles don't adjust sliders. Auto tone does, and auto tone doesn't adjust what the profile does. So yep. I try to remember to start with a profile first. I don't always remember. Um, and then I do auto tone. So sometimes I, I was like, oh crap, I forgot to choose the profile. I do it after and it, it okay. literally shouldn't make a difference technically. Um, and also before we go on, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to look at um, some of the submissions for the daily creative challenge uh, today. Ooh. And before we even do that, we're going to talk about uh, something I brought up yesterday and that is the uh, Adobe Creative um, the Adobe right. Creative right. Residency right. Community Fund. So uh, Andre... Uh, former creative resident. Again, that's a program where it's an end. It's a year long program for people that get uh, selected for it. You submit uh, your project in writing. Uh, you're interviewed. If you're selected, you get to work uh, on your project for a year paid by Adobe. Uh, but in addition to that, this year, uh, we kicked off the community, uh, the community team, same as Adobe Live, has put together a one million dollar community fund aimed at providing the resources to the negative to those negatively impacted by COVID. Uh, this project will run its entire run the entirety of 2020. So there is uh, no rush to apply. But of course, there's no reason to wait if you if you want to uh, take advantage of this fund. Uh, not all that apply will be selected. Um, but creatives can apply um, can apply for project funding or commissions through Adobe. Those selected will receive a one time grant to pursue a two to four week project. So you don't get the whole million, you know, it's, it's divided up amongst the community for the whole year. Uh, but you you do get uh, a grant for hopefully whatever we were asking for, for your project, yes. One project, $1 million, one person. Uh, Tim has already posted the uh, link in the chat for the community fund. So just if you're watching this on YouTube, you're watching this on, on Twitter, you're watching this somewhere else. That's the chance now where you want to hop over to uh, b.net slash Adobe Live. And that way you'll you'll see the chat that I'm referring to and you'll get a chance to take it take advantage of that link. Um, and Grant says, thanks for the link, Tim. I was about to copy and paste it, but Tim beat me to it. And so therefore, if you're watching this live, that's where the uh, link will be posted. If you're watching this on the replay, I don't think the chat plays during the replay on Behance, but if it does, it's there. If not, just uh, Google Adobe Creative Residency Community Fund, and um, you should be able to find the blog post about it, and the link will be there as well. All right, so let's take a look at let's take a look at some of the um, the entries for today's daily challenge, because otherwise I'll forget and we'll run out of time. And then we'll go back to Andre, and Andre can continue editing. I think he just popped over and changed the battery in his camera. If not, I'm reminding him to do so now. Already, already <laughs> All right. did. Already did. Let me pop over to uh, our Discord channel. I'm going to pick up kind of right where we left off yesterday. So yesterday, uh, the challenge was to create, uh, to make 3D objects pop out that were submitted afterwards. All right, that might have done it. Yep, we're back. Okay, that did it. Yeah, it worked. All right, we're back. We should oh, be back. Man. Hey, hey. Cue, cue the beginning of Coloring Book by Chance the Rapper. And we back. So we're back. Um, <laughs> we're back. What I was right. before we froze was that um, the community fund by um, through the Adobe Creative Residency folks is really, really cool because even if you don't get it, um, it is an awesome process for you to put pen to paper about projects that you want to do, about what the significance of it is, and being able to plan through your three, six, nine month, and one year plans and figure out and exploring avenues in which to show that work. Um, so I would just encourage people to check it out. The parameters are a lot wider so that the grants can be smaller to larger. No one's getting a million dollars. That would be crazy. But um, it's spread across so that we have the opportunity to try to work on some interesting things. So just wanted to bring that up. Okay. So very cool. Yes. So the creative back. residency program, and uh, once again, Tim posted the link in the comments. I'm not sure where you guys or where we cut off, and you guys didn't see the rest. But 
Uh, go yes. check out the community fund um, and the links there and continue on with your editing. Yes. So um, now that we put some stuff together, we're going to look at images that I actually shot. Um, this was an outtake, but I still think it's OK. Um, I actually really like this image because our subjects are a little out of focus. Um, this was an outtake because of that reason. I should have gotten her face here, but there is something nice about it feeling kind of rushed and kind of weird and natural. Um, it was for a furniture company that lets you rent furniture. I know I, us New York people are weird, but um, since we have so many um, whites in here, this is a good time to talk about um, lights and highlights like we talked about before. So we're in here, we're seeing that this white, which we know is white, is considered a mid-tone of this image. And just to clarify again, top right corner are your highlights, bottom left are your shadows, your darkest parts. Everything in this square, sorry, this square are your mid-tones. So in this image, this white's being treated as a mid-tone. So let's say we want to brighten it up, but we know that we can't have this get any brighter. So let's pick a point here. That's bright. Hold on. Or not. Well, I missed it. What are you trying to do? Um, I was just trying to select the point. Oh, there it is. Okay. For some reason, it didn't click for a second. So now I know that if I adjust my midtones, that this isn't going to act as crazy. So we also want to get some of this darker spot a little brighter too. And then we want to just pick a little spot in the middle. So here, I'm going to brighten this up. And you see as we're coming up a little bit, this area still is secure before and after. Our top left area that's really blown out is still its normal color. Nothing crazy is going on. So we add a little bit of contrast, and we're seeing this. Um, oh, man. Dude, I don't know. Lightroom, everybody's unhappy with me today. Did you pray to the demo gods last night? Dude, I don't know what is going on. I did not. I did pray to the demo gods every night, as I always do. <laughs> okay, All right, guys. So, hey, we're back. We're um, back. We're back. <laughs> Janet's asking, you know, why are you doing that? So Janet just asked a quick question, and the answer is, to your question is yes. But Janet asked, and we did cover this yesterday. Sorry if it's off topic, but can Lightroom be used to sharpen images? And we, we yes. went through examples of that yesterday. So just if you watch yesterday's replay, you can actually go see us do it. Yes. Lightroom can be used to sharpen. Uh, we talked about why texture and clarity are helpful. You should definitely check it out. I think it's um, on the second hour mark if you don't want to watch the whole two hours. Um, but you should because who doesn't like Terry on a green screen? So um, now we've used curves and we've gone from our before that's good um, to an after that has a little bit more contrast but doesn't blow out this area. And to do that, I moved our blacks up a little bit so that you can see that in this area, it's a little bit grayer. And then um, I made a little crimp so that up here, our brightest highlights, which is the stuff in this corner, aren't affected. And then I rose our midtones that are in the brighter region, which should be all of this stuff. So it's a little bit brighter. If I go too far, then you're going to see how this is just going to get too aggressive. And I don't think that helps anybody because this is supposed to feel like a comfortable um, morning for. Um, a couple enjoying a cup of coffee. And I don't know anybody that's cup of coffee looks like this. So <laughs> um, we just brought it up a little bit. And so if we want to do that in the sliders, we will bring our exposure up. But you see as we're bringing our exposure up how this area is just super blown out. So that would mean that we'd start to bring our highlights down. And we're so we're getting that detail back on the highlights. Um, bring our exposure up a little. But now we're missing a little bit of that contrast that we had when we used our curve and made that little bit of an S. So we'll add a little contrast. And now we're in a spot. I think the colors look a little more intense here. And so this would be a good time to go back to our new friend, Color Mix. And since we're going to pretend that we don't know what color this is, we can use our little target adjust. We can select. Oh, so sorry. I need to go ahead and change to Color Mix down here and our saturation, select this guy, and I want to make it a little bit less orange because we want the color to be dominant and important, but we don't want this to overtake the image because the point of this photo is kind of a nice calming morning. Maybe I went a little too far. And so orange can be pretty distracting, pretty intense. 
And now we're in an area where we've kind of tamped that color down a little bit. So these are just ways that I would normally use color mix and edit. Um, so let's look at what that looks like in other ways. Here is an image I took for a hotel in Sarasota, Florida. Um, as you can see, the main facets of this image are this blue and this orange. So um, let's say, for example, that they wanted it to be more vibrant. They wanted us to feel like it was on a Miami beach for some reason. Um, then the first thing I would do is get down here to color mix. Um, we know that it's orange, but once again, we're gonna make sure that we have gone over our color wheel, um, to our color mixer. This, this target selection allows you to both control the tone curve or control the color mixer. We click on this. We don't wanna change our hue. We wanna change our saturation. And we want to make this make this more orange. See how deep it is. Um, I might be a little aggressive, but they maybe their sick of their hotel is very like, you know, calm down after a hot day out, um, and they want it to feel this level of warmth. Notice, however, as I am doing this, how his skin is changing. So look at how his skin is getting more orange and less orange. Um, we can alter this with a selective adjust brush, but as we're starting to saturate this orange um, thing that he's laying on more and more, we're causing his skin to look a, look a little bit inaccurate. So let's saturate it a bunch like we want to. And then what I would do, if I wasn't doing it in Photoshop, is go over to our adjustment brush. This is way too large, so I'm gonna go ahead and bring it down by hitting these bracket key sliders. Just slid this is taking way too long. Um, and just go ahead and start to paint him in. And so that I can go ahead and take this edge. Um, and like I said, when you're looking at this, where the plus on it is, let me show you. That plus shows you um, where this is the strongest. The outer ring um, is kind of like the edges of the bristles of the brush, so in that, like, it's still does some things, but it's much more feathered. So I can go ahead and be over here and I can know that it's not going to start to run into this with the same level of intensity. So now I might be able to go over our saturation and bring it down a little bit. And if you're not sure what that looks like, I'll take it away, put it back. Um, and show you what it looks like. So this is now he's painted in. We're going to bring our saturation down a little. And now we have something that we are more used to. So this is just as orange and his skin looks closer to what it did when we started. So we get what they want, which is something that's a little bit brighter, a little bit more vibrant without making him look like a crazy orange person. And there's only one of those. Um, and he is not here. Any thoughts, Terry, before I go to anything else? No, oh, that was wonderfully executed. Do we have any questions from folks? Uh, nope, they're just happy we're I'm back. Trying to, I'm trying to ask um, a little bit more instead of waiting and dumping it all at you after like 10 minutes of a monologue. No, nope, no, nope, thanks. <laughs> um, we so got about eight minutes left, by the way. Okay, so let's look at this. This is a portrait of author Cal Newport in uh, DC. He, this was for some, uh, for a magazine and you're probably wondering why did I take this outside? One of his big things is that every day he has like a, a precisely a walk at precisely this amount of time where he likes to go and ruminate on ideas before he writes more. Um, and so, yeah, okay. We want to brighten this up. Great. But let's talk about the fact that maybe they are publishing this in the fall and they want these leaves to just look a little bit more lively. Um, and so let's say that we're not sure, which we aren't, if this would fall under the category of yellow or orange. So we go ahead and we select that, and we're seeing it's choosing yellow. Down here, we want to choose saturation. And we just want to bring it up a little bit. And you're seeing how we're getting this warmth. But just like before, realize that since we're on the warmer spectrum of yellow, red, and orange, we're starting to make his skin look a little bit warmer. And this is actually something I really wanted to bring up 
Um, one thing that color mix really helps you with is um, for my more fair skin folks, if you have a portrait taken of you, like let's say that you're an exercise model, um, something Terry and I do every day, people take photos of push ups, um, and you get really sweaty um, or you're really warm or you're just taking a shower and there's like you're a little red and blotchy, the um, color mix tool for red could be really helpful because it can just kind of bring down some of this that warmth on your face a little bit to the point where it looks less aggressive and makes your skin look less uneven um, or more even. I don't know why I, did, I chose to go with the harder route there. Um, and so now we have an image that is a little bit warmer. Look at our original, it's brighter. Um, our orange and our yellows look more inviting. Um, and we have a portrait of a man that's pretty serious. Um, normally I would want my subjects to look a little bit more gleeful, but this is what he's like and I don't, I'm not going to force him into something else. So even something as small as this could be helpful in getting it closer to a mood that they might want. Um, to show you again what you can do with Hue, here's another photo from that um, stretch that we talked about, um, about someone's home. And so first I would say I don't love that this plant is coming in. If I had taken more of it in there, it'd be nice, but up here it seems a little distracting. So. I'm going to hold shift and bring down our edit. I also want to make sure we're in line with this windowsill. So I'm going to just rotate this slightly. Are those little squares we talked about before? And now we have an image that I think is a little bit crisper, a little bit cleaner. Um, and I want to set points. Bring this up a little bit. We're a little bit brighter on our curves. Um, we're going to flatten a little bit by bringing our lights down and we're going to bring these darks up a little. Um, and so our goal coming from here to here is actually this client has a very like light and airy look. They want everything to feel um, really bright. And this is something that really makes sense for a lot of furniture companies because they want everyone to be able to see all the furniture. And so the moodiness and images can be less effective in their lifestyle. So um, if, if I was turning this into them, I'd obviously get rid of this Nike check, but that's not what we're going to do right now. We're going to get down here, go to back to color mix. We're going to select this, even though we know we're pretty sure that it's yellow. We're going to select it. Um, we have our saturation tool set. And let's say we wanted this yellow to kind of pop more, but you're seeing how as we change it, it's altering her face. This is, oh, sorry, excuse me. This is calling it more of an orange. This is also calling it an orange. Let's see what happens when we select, select yellow. So yeah, if we select yellow, you're seeing how, as we bring these up, um, like Terry and I were talking about before, often there are colors and other colors. So something that might show up as orange could be impacted by yellow, red, and um, orange itself. And so here we're adding some orange. We want to maybe add some luminance to brighten the color up and to go along with the, what the client said. And then lastly, we talked about this in temperature. We can make this a little bit warmer or if we wanted to do another way, we can go over this blue tone curve, select our points, and just come down a little bit so we're a little bit warmer. Um, this, I personally wouldn't make it warmer. I just wanted to kind of show you, remind you how to do it. Um, and when we're talking about um, using curves, what I've been doing is just selecting one point in each of these little zones, this being your midtone, this is being your darks and your lights and then pulling from a certain area so that um, you can kind of maintain control and not impact everything all at once. Cool. All you right. You got anything so to add? Couple... Yep. Oh, nope. go Good. Couple questions. Um, so Carolyn, actually Carolyn, I'll get, I'll get to yours second. Uh, Eleanor is saying the class is very informative. At what point does headroom uh, become a concern? And so if you oh. like, if you go back to that last portrait, where'd you go? Here we go. Like, for example, um, my style used to be that I would, sh I would have shot that a lot tighter and there would be a lot less headroom. But mm -hmm. now that I'm shooting a lot of images and submitting them also to Adobe stock, I um, I leave the headroom for for um, for copy for um, people that like to buy images where there's uh, room to put their message um, and yes, they can always exactly crop it. I can always crop it. 
So headroom becomes a concern only from a composition and a stylistic point. Uh, whereas now, if you shoot it cropped, you're out of luck. There's nothing you can do. But if you shoot it um, with a lot of headroom, you can always crop it to what you like going forward or the client can. Uh, now, yep. back to Carolyn's question. Can there be a future session about split toning? We got about two minutes, so I'm just going to pop over to my desktop real quick because do it, do it, it, it should take me less than two minutes to do this. Uh, but yeah. anyway, so let's say I wanted to do some split toning on this tree. I'm just going to go ahead and make it black and white first. I'm just going to take the saturation all the way down. And then I'm going to go to effects where you will find split toning. And basically what split Wait, toning what's, what's is, split is toning? Oh, you're about to tell them. It's, tell them. <laughs> it's, it's adding color to your shadows or highlights. You can do both, but you, you'd have to be really clever in, in picking the right colors for both. Uh, so, for example, if I click on the shadows and I move my color stop anywhere I want, the shadows start to become that color, therefore making it a split tone. Now, I usually leave it there. I usually don't go any further. You can go like way down into the shadows or make it just a little bit in the shadows. You have an um, amount slider right here. But you can go in. There's nothing stopping you from going in and say, I also want to add some color to the highlights. But again, you're usually going to wreck it before you make it better. So I, I tend to tell people to stick to one or the other unless you have two very specific colors that will look good to go together in the shadows and highlights. I, I, I don't like doing both. Um, but that, of course, it is up to you. You can use it any way you want. That's it. That's what split toning is. All right. I'm, you got 30 seconds. Or do you just want to say goodbye? Um, I was, I was going to try to show. There was an, I went to University of Florida, and they did some promo images when I went there. That was a perfect example of split toning in both. I didn't love what they did, but basically they did is they made all of the shadows blue and all of the highlights orange, um, but in a really soft way so that every promo piece of image, I can't find it in time, every promo right. image um, had that. And so that would be an example of doing both, but I agree with Terry. Um, adding both can be a little bit intense. Um, adding or split toning can be super helpful. And I know we're running out of time. Thank you so much for being a part of the chat. If you have other questions, you can reach out to me on Behance, Instagram, Twitter, um, all over the place. And I'm really easy to find. Please tell them that you love this chat if you did or this class. And I will happily come back and do this with Terry, without Terry, on the moon, just anywhere with internet. All right, cool. And we had a lot of fun today. Sorry for the technical issues, but that's what happens when you're live, especially in a pandemic. So things happen. Um, we uh, Luckily, we were able to get, get you back on or get you back up and running. And we are um, very happy with the session we had today and yesterday. So once again, stay tuned. There is more coming up next. Uh, I believe it is the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge. And with that said, we're out. I'm out for the weekend. I'll be back on Tuesday, I think. But um, you guys have a good stream in the meantime and stay tuned to Adobe Live for more. Bye, everybody. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye.